Okay, hi. My name is Catherine E.T. Carnell. I need you to raise your hand in the back. If at any point you can't hear me, flag me down. Um, okay, you can't hear me already. Okay, awesome. Okay, we will have a shouting good time. Um, I go by Catherine E.T. Carnell. That's how you can find me on the internet. Uh, E.T. are my middle initials. I go by Catherine E.T. Carnell because when I Googled myself, I found a Catherine Carnell in prison, and I am not in prison, nor do I ever aspire to be. So if you're looking for me right now, it's Catherine E.T. Carnell. The other ones, I don't know her. I am a teacher. I teach via Thrive DX, and they help place us at universities to teach cybersecurity, basically intro-level boot camps. It's really fun. I also graduated from the boot camp. Um, I lost my job in the public school system, more or less during lockdowns, and pivoted to cybersecurity. I found it really just kind of like innate, candidly. It made sense, it resonated, and then Thrive hired me. So here we are. I'm really excited to give this talk today so I can spare my family the agony of ranting about this at inconvenient times. So I hope that you guys enjoy this rant. I love feedback because I teach over Zoom. So again, if you can't hear me at any time, yell out. Um, if I talk too fast, like the prior presenter said, flag me down. I am not offended. This is a conversation. Um, I, I don't want to. I don't want to leave anybody out because I think I know how it sounds. So, with that being said, uh, let's begin. Ta-da! All right. So in the intro session, John Strand talked about not becoming a Dilbert cartoon, but this was too good to not contribute. My name is Catherine E.T. Carnell. Uh, again, I've kind of given you my intro, but uh, this is for y'all's benefit because it was too good. And I love privacy. I just love it. It's my personal passion. I am not employed as a pri privacy professional. I do this because I enjoy it. So this would go in the personal research section of your resume if you went to the workshop yesterday, right? Um, I hope that I can provide something of value here for you today that's actionable, that you can take back and apply to your daily lives. And I hope that we can start a different conversation about the internet, um, where it came from, and where it's going, right? Because if you're here, I think you know that we have some privacy problems in our uh, in our world. Okay, here is my disclaimer. News articles and examples of both good and bad privacy are going to be included. Um, that means mentioning company names. I am not trying to slander anybody, okay? These are news articles I took off of research off the free and open internet. And I'm saying that because this is a hard conversation to have about user privacy and digital surveillance because nobody wants to point fingers and I don't think we should be pointing fingers, okay? This is just my little disclaimer. If you have been watching the news, you saw recently a US-EU Privacy Act was signed in. Did you guys see that? Raise your hands, nod. Awesome, okay. If we as a community don't manage our company and user privacy, the law is gonna come in in reaction to incidents and manage it for us. And if they don't consult with people who understand the limitations of the technology we're using, we will get legal solutions that don't effectively work, right? Hopefully, at the end of this talk, you will be equipped to go out and talk about user privacy, entity privacy, right? Collections of people, also known as companies, because a company is just a group of people with a similar mission right, in a way that is approachable, understandable, clear, and engaging, right? That is the hope. All right. So first and foremost, I want to cover two things, actually three. Uh, these are my notes because I'm a compulsive writer, and I love to write, and I think in sentences. Ethics inform standards, and this is a talk about ethics, not compliance. So if you are here for compliance, please go hear Gerald. He's phenomenal. I'm in his master class online on compliance right now, and it's great. You will not offend me. This is not on compliance. It's about ethics. Ethics inform standards, also known as compliance. Compliance are the metrics 
right? The combination of ethics and technical capacity that we agree as a community are going to yield the highest level of human flourishing for our businesses, for our technology environments, and for our users, right? And our business goals. So this is about what's behind compliance, which is ethics. And again, if you're like, I got out of this in high school, I'm never going to sit through another ethics talk. You can leave. It's cool. We're still friends. Two, ethics come with a duty. If you recognize a moral ought, you recognize that you have a moral responsibility. On a high level, this is as easy as it is wrong to do something and therefore I will not do it, i.e. our entire black hat hacker, white hat hacker system. If we as a community did not know that we needed ethics and that there was some kind of clear objective ethical standard for behavior in the world, right? Just on a basic level, we can all go in a thousand directions arguing the specifics, but on a basic level, right? Then we wouldn't have that system. As a community, we rely on ethics very, very deeply at a minimal level. It is better to help than to harm, okay? So with ethics come a duty. It is wrong to hack illegally. It is wrong to hack without consent. Right, that qualifies you as a black hat hacker operating outside of ethics and outside the law. We agree that is a no-no, i.e. ethics come with duty. Ethical duty and responsibility lead to action. Again, this is just kind of reiterating that point. This is really important for the rest of the talk. The other thing I wanted to cover is that this talk is really top heavy. We're doing a lot of exposition and then we've got some examples and we're done. So make it up to bullet point like three and you can rest for the rest of the talk, okay? <laughs> awesome. An ethic can mean any system of values-driven behavior, even if those values aren't the best and the highest. This is a reflection of the kind of technical definition of ethic, right? We all know that a, a, a true ethic or is oriented towards the good right, towards human flourishing, towards good action. However, hedonism is technically an ethic, if you want to be specific, right, because someone values pleasure, even at the expense of other obvious goods, and therefore they pursue that pleasure, even if it doesn't yield the highest satisfaction in other areas. Um, there are a lot of really dramatic examples of this in, um, I guess in TV, if you can say TV literature, uh, does anybody not know what hedonism is? Did I just lose the crowd? I hope not. Okay, so this is a great example of an ethic that is not oriented towards objective good, right? I really love Calvin and Hobbes, so I hope you do too. However, we don't want to operate like this. Normally and colloquially, ethics indicate a positive system of values, seeking what is truly best, not just for the individual, but for the community of individuals. Um, and I think cybersecurity, everyone should have kind of an innate understanding of this, right? That's the whole point of having cybersecurity for an organization. It's the whole point um, of, of making sure that we're clear on what compliance says. Um, if we didn't agree that it was better to protect people, we wouldn't be here. I think it's, I think it's that simple. User environment. This is about the internet. The internet was developed as a, as a government research tool. Do we all agree? The internet is now a private citizenry and public government research tool, right? We have multi-faces to the internet. If I write in my email a letter to my grandparents about their uh, 401k um, or their retirement plan, that's really not a public message, right? There is a very private face to the internet, um, at least for the user. And that's really who I'm concerned about today is the user. Um, I, yeah, I come from a small town. I have a neighbor whose brother-in-law was almost taken for $10,000 because of a phishing campaign. Um, this is within the last few months. They're elderly. They're concerned. How do they know about me? How did they find me? The average user is not aware of the massive rivers of information being shared on the foundational levels of the internet. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Okay. Um, these are up here for your benefit. I'm going to touch on a few that I think are really relevant just to emphasize. 
This is not a collective summary of all the available statistics on the internet. You can go out and find much more than this, right? Okay, this is just the stuff that I think is relevant. For example, 97% of Americans own a cell phone of some kind. That's relevant. Say half those Americans don't understand that the information they send to their providers is in some way collated and calculated. We have a huge breakdown in what the user understands is the ethic of the internet, the accepted practices and procedures of their personal device, versus what we as professionals know is the ethic of the internet, i.e. the limitations placed in our technology, the way in which it's communicated, and by its origin, okay? The internet is only as private as the technology allows it to be, for one, right? Um, and two, companies that came up in the internet when it was primarily kind of a public government research thing, not really, you know, cell phone, smartphone facing, their ethic is the prior ethic, which is this is a public service over which I am pretty much entitled to use your information, not maliciously, but it's because this is the prior ethic, how we did things. And therefore, new users who get cell phones that look like a digital diary and write in it things like Dear Santa don't understand how much information they are giving away in one way or another, right? All right, this is the top heavy part of the talk I was talking about. This is the world internet, if I need to read it, I'm reading it for the folks at home, the world internet usage and population statistics. I have a citations list. If you wanna get it, you can see me later. I'll, I'll get your email and email it to you. This is really important, okay? The internet is not a purely government and research tool anymore, right? So when I say the ethics of digital surveillance, I'm, talking, I'm not just talking about like the moral goods, whether or not it's good. I'm talking about the practical actions derived from responsibilities derived from the original intention of the internet. I touched it, <laughs> which was to be public and government facing, right? Habit, moral, practical, cultural business habits within the IT industry, right, which we are technically a part of, that the user is not informed of implicitly when they receive their personal device unless they read the privacy policy. And who reads the privacy policy? Yeah, I started reading the privacy. Yeah, two out of like, I don't know, 30, I don't, I don't know numbers, two out of many. <laughs> Um, I started reading the privacy policy a little bit ago when I picked up on targeted advertising, right? I was like, wow, I can't believe the internet knows that I want to buy a new couch. And for a while it was cool. Yeah, it is creepy. It is creepy. It was cool when I thought that I could just buy it all and was having fun. It became creepy for me. And I guess this is a little bit of a personal story. It became creepy for me when I realized that, again, those personal emails that I was sending to my grandmother, my whoever, my family about things that are personal to me, hobbies, whatever, not necessarily things that are clandestine, but just things that I don't want a company to know. You know what I mean? Um, I don't need uh, I don't need a name brand company no matter how much of a household name they are, to know that I'm a major Star Wars fan who likes to go to conventions in costume and be there right now if I had enough money, okay? I don't need them to know that. Not because it's illicit or like icky, but because it's personal. And personal to the user implies private, and, but it doesn't imply private to the company, right? We know that. We know that because of the way in which data is collected. So I love Randy Palsh. Um, does anybody know about Randy Palsh? One, two, he's great. You should, go, you should all go look him up. He's phenomenal. He was a Carnegie Mellon, uh, Mellon researcher. He's just like, he's phenomenal. Um, he is his last lecture, my first exposure personally to innovative technology being used creatively. He worked on some of the first VR systems. It's really amazing work. Um, and he has a great, he quoted this in his talk um, and I think it's relevant, which is when there's an elephant in the room, introduce them. And consumer personal user surveillance is the elephant in the room. Um, 
as the personal internet has developed, engaging in the internet has become less of a choice and more of a necessity, right? In order to participate in the world at large, it is no longer optional to say to somebody, well, if you want privacy, you can move to the woods <laughs> and get a cabin, which is the, what I got from people when I said, I'm going to go talk about user privacy. I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want isolation. I just want privacy. I want some control. And I don't want to have to read thousands of words in order to get a little control over what's shared with other people. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> this is really the elephant in the room. If you are aware of this, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, what if I told you that there is an entire behind the scenes market that depends on users agreeing to excessively long and in semi-invasive data collection policies and retention techniques to the tune of $200 billion in revenue a year? Yeah? Elephant. This is called the data broker market. If you are a data broker in this room or listening to this talk, I am not coming for your jugular. I understand people are people, people make choices, people have different opinions. And if you don't agree with this talk or this sentiment, I understand, I'll wanna talk about it with you, but I get it. But we do need to talk about this as an industry because if we don't talk about it, the government will talk about it. And applying solutions that are not implemented or at least addressed by the experts will undercut the functionality of our services, okay? It'd be like a non-doctor writing the Hippocratic Oath. We need to take responsibility for our ethic, right? Both morally, how we wanna treat people, and practically, how we can implement the moral odds across our technology according to the limitations of that technology and according to the limitations of what's truly good right? As white hat hackers or, or people, you know, white hat security professionals, which as an aside, that was developed, I think, as a result of like the classic Westerns, right? Where the bad guy wore a black hat and the good guy wore a white hat. So fitting for Deadwood. Yeah. None of these companies or very few are user facing. Okay. I can't walk into a storefront and say, hi, I'd like a receipt of all my data processed across five different companies that I listen to in your team. Um, over the past four years, I can't do that. These things are not user facing. Okay, data brokers collect and aggregate a number of information points about users, including usernames, user family members' names, addresses, telephone numbers, email addresses, gender, age, sexual preference, marital status, children, education, profession, income, political convictions, property, Right? Like what you own. Do you own a boat? Do you need insurance? Do you own a house? Do you rent? Purchases over your credit card. What you purchase. How you purchase it. Did you use PayPal? Did you use a card reader? Did you type it in manually? Your health information. Um, your medical problems, which we're going to get to that in a minute, and et cetera. And real time location data. Real time location data. If you want my sources, I will send them to you. Come see me after. It's just hard to put it all into an hour. So the definition of data broker from Gartner, and I wanna read this to you from Gartner. A data broker is a business that collects information from a bunch of different places, processes it to enrich, cleanse, or analyze it, and licenses it, or sells it, to other organizations. Data brokers can also license another company's data directly or process another organization's data to provide them with enhanced results. Data is typically accessed via an application programming interface or API and frequently involves subscription type contracts. Data typically is not sold in the sense that the data broker loses its rights to it, but it is exchanged for money. Um, that's why they're saying licensed, right? For a particular or limited use. A data broker is also sometimes known as an information broker, a syndicated data broker or information product company. That's from Gartner, okay? As the data brokerage industry expands, companies have tremendous financial incentive to partner with data brokers against their users 
many of whom have no idea this shadowed world of information brokerage at their expense exists from Epic, which is a privacy group, right? Before this talk, how many of you knew the specifics of this industry? One, two, good, 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 good. All the numbers I'm about to read or the, the key ones are listed on the sheet. Anybody can pay $79 for a list of people by health condition category. Some health specific categories include, and this is, we're gonna talk about specific conditions. It might be a little, it's gonna be medically descriptive. Include anorexia, substance abuse, depression, um, and elder specific maladies, right? Dementia, et cetera. The average email address will retail for $89. Um, this was a study conducted by Experian Cheetah Mail, and I got that from the drum. There are approximately 4,000 known data brokerage companies worldwide. 14,000 leading consumer brands, however, not specifically qualified as data brokers, as data, but don't quite qualify per the definition as data brokers. According to polls, approximately 80% of U.S. email addresses are available on websites like Tower Data. Et cetera. I've never known tower data. I'm sorry, this is research. Um, not trying to come at you. 38% of employed Americans' pay stub information um, is available online. About 45% of data brokers technically allow consumers to opt out, but that requires the consumer, one, know about the data broker, two, can find their website, three, can navigate to their user portal, and four, can endure talking to them and or reading the opt-out contracts. So a little less than half. Right. People have to pay about ninety nine to two hundred dollars, depending on the opt out service. So, like, for example, if you there are some companies now who will automatically opt you out from known data brokers. I use one, actually. <laughs> now that I'm writing this talk, I use one now. It, it works, but it is expensive. Um, and that's just not that's not just right. That's not equal. Axiom, a specific data brokerage company, um, has 23 K servers collecting and analyzing computer data. It has data on 500 million consumers worldwide and on average obtains 3,000 data points per person. People are generating nearly 2.5 quintillion bytes of data each day from IBM. I guarantee the prior ethic of the internet, which was research and government oriented like the originating ethic, did not account for the fact that everyone was going to be on the internet and was going to be generating 2.5 quintillion bytes of data each day. So when I'm talking about these companies, these companies came up in the old ethic of the internet, which was that this is a public service, right? I can take data, you know, data is the language of the internet. It's like saying hello. It's not prepared to handle the massive influx of user data, right? Or people that expect that personal equals private. It's just not equipped and we need to talk about it. By 2023, Big data will be worth an estimated $77 billion from Commando Tech. Okay. Data growth statistics show that more than two-thirds of data today is generated by individuals and not companies from baseline. Um, website data analysis shows that more than 570 new websites are created every day, again, from baseline. And as you are reading this, information is being generated all around us, right? Businesses and individuals are increasingly moving their operations online, and as a result, machine-generated data about people is also rising exponentially. And according to a study done um, by, <laughs> according to a study done, um, a user email. This is really we're going to we're going to touch on this more specifically later. Um, a user email is worth about eighty-nine dollars to a company, right? And at the standard life cycle of an email before it becomes irrelevant is about four years. There are another, like, there are other better talks on this, I think, um, about the cross-referencing of like missing persons and all of this aggregated data, which I, as a threat actor, which I'm not a threat actor, but if I was, could go and buy. But that's not this talk, because <laughs> I don't have enough time. But this is, this is important. All right, so what is privacy? I think it's easy to define things by the negatives, right? So privacy is not only being observed a little. Privacy is not having to choose whether or not you want to trade PII for increasingly necessary services. How many of us have been told to get on an online search platform? How many of us had to move primarily to the internet during lockdowns? The internet is no longer an option. Um, and as a result, we can't hold the internet out as something which I can extract from you 
who you are in order to use it beyond what is required for the technology. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. We'll get to Alma Arnold. Anonymization is not privacy. Privacy means uh, Fastly's a company, Panther's a company. This is me, <laughs> um, a summary. So privacy, right? Some definitions. Being free from observation. And again, like Jaina Inger from Fastly wrote in their article, it's really good. This is not anywhere more important than on the internet when we're literally investing social trust into other people to carry our information, right? Um, in a lot of ways, the internet is a giant social experiment at this point, right? Like having an online neighborhood. I don't know the SOC analyst. I don't know the people who process my data, but I trust them to be ethical with it. Nothing like that has ever been done before, and yet that is the evolved ethic of the internet. But the data brokerage industry and the data hoarding habits have not caught up with that ethic in which, as a user, I implicitly place my trust in you to be responsible with my information every time I log on, right? And that's why we're having this talk, old ethic versus new ethic. And as a community, again, we need to talk about it without pointing fingers or anything like that, because we need everyone on board. Um, we need the big companies who collect this information to understand why this is so important. Um, before we move on, we also need to accept that some level of information transfer is a prerequisite of social community. So I'm standing up here. You can see that I'm wearing a Stark Industries t-shirt, right? Which means that I like Tony Stark and Marvel. Um, you can see I have brown hair. I've told you my name is Catherine E.T. You could probably dig around and find me a lot about me. Um, and I accept this as a prerequisite for having some kind of community with you. Now, if I had not told you about my Star Wars, um, my love for Star Wars and the fact that I love, I would love to go and like make cool costumes and like build my own Mandalorian body armor, you would never know that right? That's something I volunteered. However, pictures of me in Star Wars costumes are on the internet. And if you have the right analytics, you could probably dig that up. I wouldn't be thrilled about it. But that's the difference between personal and private, right? I put those photos on my personal Facebook years ago. I am sure that they are still out there, especially because Facebook, and I love you if you work at Facebook, but especially because they don't know, right? And I'm sure you saw this article where the, how their data is flowing. And if you didn't see it, we'll get to that later, okay? And that again is a product of the old ethic not being equipped to handle the new habit of users on the internet. Okay, a right to privacy or need for privacy. This is important before we move on. We all need to agree that human beings have some level of a need, innate need for privacy. You can see this in animal behavior all the time. Animals will seek out spaces. If you've ever adopted a dog or cat, you know that animal will go and they will find a space until they feel comfortable, right? Privacy is an innate need for beings, for creatures, right? And we're human beings. We're, you know, we're, we need privacy. Um, that's why we have houses. That's why we have doors. You know, it's not because we don't like the people out there, but some things deserve a sacred space, okay? Whether or not people have an essential need and therefore right to privacy, I think, is the determining question of how we move forward. Because I could very easily see, and I've heard from people who have said, you know, people really don't have a right to privacy anymore. They gave that up when they got on the internet. I'm like, no, they didn't, because they didn't know they were gonna, you were gonna collect everything about them, including when their dog died when they were nine. You know, someone can't consent to something they're not informed of. Um, and it, it falls, the burden falls on the initiator to inform properly when it comes to consent. And again, that's old ethic versus new ethic. When, when the internet was research-oriented and government-based and public, it really didn't matter as much. Now that it is a sprawling ecosystem resembling the Amazon jungle, it does matter. Okay. So, what is this? Raise your hand. Or we can keep going, yeah? Yes! Privacy screens! If I had something to give you, I would. Doop, doop. What's this? Privacy screens. What's that? <laughs> Shout it out. <laughs> privacy screens, yes. Or privacy blinds, I don't care. 
Privacy blinds is a great analogy to how privacy should be conducted on the internet. You know there's a window there. You can see there's a house, right? So just like the internet, you know, you know there's a computer connecting. You can probably see the, the, you know, the relevant addresses and stuff, blah, blah, blah. But the actual stuff and people behind it is obscured. Blinds don't impact window functionality either when they're rolled down. You know, there's still a window there. It doesn't just go away. It's not moving into the woods, cutting off all communication and changing its name, right? Great analogy for a new ethic of the internet in which we have people who need to be able to take back their information or at least be assured that just because they connect to do a free service, they're not suddenly giving away <laughs> all of their grandparents' money to a fisher who buys her information from a data broker, okay? Uh, human beings have a need for privacy they can control and an inherent right to it. We covered this. This is just to outline the premise of this talk. Um, we accept that some vulnerability is a prerequisite for human connection, both in the physical world and on its digital surface. But I don't have to let the post office into my house every time they deliver me a letter. Again, a great concept for a new ethic to user privacy on the internet. So we understand the medium, again, I've said this a few times, the medium dictates the level of privacy we can have, right? So computers, you're never gonna be able to ghost computer, you know, just like, like go up into the service and take what you want and disappear and like never leave a trace. That's the whole, you know, that's kind of a, that's kind of a, if you can do that, you need to come see me because that's really cool. By definition, computers have to be recognized on a network in order to connect. Even a VPN doesn't erase your information, it masks it. Right? It provides different information to conceal your identity like a privacy blind. Ha uh ha! -huh. <laughs> okay? So we're not saying, again, that we need to somehow transcend how the internet connects in order to ensure user privacy. We're saying we need more disclosure from companies. We need better, some of whom don't really understand how this is happening, again. Okay? Because the old ethic has organically evolved into something new. And we need to work with the limitations of the internet and networked technologies in order to guarantee users privacy that they feel they're already getting when they use a personal device. Okay. We're almost to the juicy stuff, I promise. Privacy and liberty go hand in hand. If I am not free to make decisions outside of external meddling, I do not have liberty. If I have somebody telling me who I am, based upon my data points, and I can't change that because that profile is stored somewhere else. That's really not liberty. Um, this is a definition of liberty from Merriam Webster. If we don't have liberty, we don't have the right to use the internet as free people. We can see this nowhere better than overseas right now in China, in Iran. These people connected to the internet thinking, I am a human being having a human experience and I am gonna use the internet to better myself and my family right? In Iran, the internet's been shut down. That's not a public service, but it's treated like, or it's not a private service, but it's been treated like a private service, right? I'm sure all those people had their information collected, and then the internet's just turned off. Aren't they stakeholders in the internet? I mean, they paid for it in their identity. That's not right. We need a new ethic of a private, a private facing internet. All right. Oh, Pressy is doing this to me. I'm sorry. I thought it would be fun, but now it's a hassle. Okay. This is the good stuff. This is why you came. Okay. Surveillance paranoia. People understand this environment implicitly. That's why we have so many jokes about why Alexa can hear us all the time, right? People know that there's something going on and it's not great, okay? Getting people to use the internet above a certain age is hard, right? I've heard from so many people, well, I can't use the internet, okay, because they're gonna spy on me. And that's like how they say it too. The last time I did this talk, it was three hours um, and it was for a group of elderly folks. And that's what their sentiment was. How can I use the internet without being spied on? I'm like, spied on by who? They're like, I don't know the internet. That's what people feel about targeted advertising, about the fact they'll say something with their phone in the room and they don't know how it works. Hell, I don't know how it works. 
right? I would need to read, I would need to read the documentation in order to really iterate how technically it's being communicated, even if I have a technical conceptive understanding of how it's being iterated, okay? Are we done with this one? I thought that one was fun. Thelma Arnold, right? One of the first, I think, huge examples of why user privacy was in jeopardy. This was in 2006, okay? Thelma Arnold. Oh man. So AOL, God bless AOL. I love AOL. I had my first IM on AOL. Um, Kit Kat Kate, I hope you can't still find me. They released in order to demonstrate their user privacy schemas, a lot of data, you can read it. Using what we now call OSINT, which I love, <laughs> um, because it's cool and scary. People figured out that the certain user was Thelma Arnold. AOL's response to Thelma, who is an older lady, we're sorry to her specifically. There is not a lot we can do. Wow. Nice. This is in 2006. Facebook. I love you, Facebook. Again, I will send this link to you if you want it. Um, a leaked document written by Facebook's ad engineers discusses in candid terms the data management issues a social network faces. I think more than anyone else right now, they've adopted that kind of organic development of the internet as far as users connecting over remote points. And I get it. It's cool. That's what I wanted on my internet. I want to be able to connect from anywhere. I want to be able to talk to my family. Like, I get it. It's reasonable. I get it. However, this is not acceptable. Right? It's just not. You cannot have a company that asks for vested user trust, personal information, all of which I, as a social engineer, can take and put into password, right, brute force mechanisms. You've got your name, your parents' names, your sister's names. You've got your home addresses. You've got your photos. I will take all of that, and I will leverage it to get into your system as a pen tester, as a threat actor, right, if I'm on a contract. I'll get it off Facebook. If they're managing that kind of information, they need to have a user privacy policy, right, that corresponds to the level of risk they're asking their users to accept by engaging in their services. This is a product, in my opinion, of the old ethic versus the new ethic, okay? All right, this is the Twitter breach with Mudge. Does anybody hear about that? Yeah, no? Okay. Twitter does not fully understand the scale of what data it collects. He was the, with the Twitter whistleblower that came out very, very recently. And again, I love social media. I have a Twitter. However, your privacy needs to correspond to the level of risk you're asking your users to accept. Foreign threat actors using social media as leverage for whatever their plans are is a huge problem. Okay? In the rest of this article, they talk about how foreign threat actors have tried to use Twitter specifically to get into the United States' information world, right? Again, old ethic in which users were government contractors and researchers and public facing and really weren't saying, hey, grandma, I, it's Catherine, how are you? I just made a lot of money in the lottery in their email, right? The new ethic needs to reflect the level of risk you're asking your users to accept. So how do you not burn people on the internet and network technologies when their privacy is being so severely mishandled and you treat them right? You model transparent and succinct consents and opt-outs. You make your privacy statements user-focused and concise. You work together in your teams, right, to make sure everyone's on the same page design that mimics, right, the privacy policy things are clear and you teach your users about functional cookies or trackers in a few sentences so they understand the technical disclosure required to use your service. These are all some positives with the internet, and this is why we shouldn't just blow it all up. Long distance communication, remote education, of which I am a beneficiary, med tech advancements, exploration, food preservation and transportation, right, to needy communities, okay? Blind assist, disability assist, readers, text readers, all kinds of things. Um, and again, this entire community is built around a network ecosystem. I don't want to nuke it off the face of the earth. 
Uh, Trace Labs is a great group. They use OSINT, i.e. the rivers of internet or the rivers of data flowing over the internet to find missing persons. I got to volunteer with them at DEF CON. It was great. Finding missing people is a great advantage of having information at large. I would highly recommend you go and look them up. Um, all right. So when I said the talk was talk heavy, that's what I meant. The rest of this, all of these other ones are like one slide because now we're gonna look at examples of what we've been talking about, okay? This isn't relevant. If you're looking at me and saying, hey, this is really not material, I don't really think this is relevant to what I'm doing in my life. Epsilon versus DOJ. The marketing giant, Epsilon, again, I tried to put the source in here because I thought it was appropriate. Uh, data management has been charged criminally and agreed to pay 1,500 million or 150 million, I can do numbers, for helping facilitate elder fraud schemes, right? This was in 2021. This is insider threat, guys, all right? Epsilon is a data broker, for the record. Amy Boyer. Amy Boyer was killed by a stalker because he bought her email from DocuSearch, who sells information technically, which makes them categorically a data broker, even if they aren't defined as one, for $45. $45 for her life. This is not a joke. This is why I didn't wear my shiny silver hat that I picked up on the first day of this conference. This is really, really serious, okay? We cannot gamble with people who rely on us to treat their information like it was our own, okay? We can't. We absolutely cannot. Her law to protect the sale of SSN died in Congress. Life 360, I had the app for a while. They've been selling family location data. Again, not acceptable. The reason I had Life360 is because my parents didn't want me to wander around a foreign state at night at college without somebody looking for me if I was abducted, right? I was like, what, 18 when I went to college? I think that's pretty reasonable. The social trust placed in Life360 is so high. We cannot look at companies who manage the intimate personal details of people's lives and say, it's okay if you do whatever you want, including selling it for a profit. The saga of Google Analytics in the Netherlands. I didn't read it in Dutch. <laughs> I read the summary in English. Google Analytics does not appear to comply with the general data protection regulation, okay? And moreover, they're gonna determine whether Google Analytics is even allowed. If your product is not allowed in a country because it violates the privacy regulations, I have serious questions about what you're collecting and why. And on that, the G Suite for Education used by tremendous numbers of students and minors across the world collects outrageous amounts of information as a prerequisite for service and it is just unacceptable. And again, I am not trying to, they, Google is not the enemy. They are a product of the prior ethic in which this was overlooked and okay, all right? I understand that I'm going, yeah, I'll send you the articles if you want them. Those are the summaries. Come see me for the, come see me again. Give me your email, I'll send you my sources. Data brokerage as news has escaped containment, okay? What are all of these on the side? John Oliver covered um, suffering seniors on his data broker segment, which I watched recently. I thought it was a little raunchy, but hilarious and scary. What are these? Anybody, wild guess. These are lists you can buy from data brokerage companies. Are we okay with this? This is not okay, all right? It's not. Uh, infos from the World Privacy Forum, okay? Privacy, if, if data is the new oil, then privacy is the new fuel efficient car, okay? User privacy is super important because people can get information, threat actors can get this information, okay? And it's insane to think that we're okay as a culture by co collating communities, candidly, who need our help into lists that can be abused by whoever's in charge of them. All right. This is what I meant again by the top heavy slideshow. The rest of this is gonna go really fast. Threats. This is the summary from the prior section. Social credit systems, a shadow society in which people have profiles attached to their names that ping and drop every time you try to access your credit score, right? That's why that happens, because there's an algorithm looking you up. If your behavior is dictated by how it will impact your 
social credit score digitally, that is not liberty and you are not free. That is not acceptable. Okay, insider threat, Epsilon versus DOJ. It's like the Ring of Power and Lord of the Rings, not the new series, but the concept. Too much power, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Okay, I'm not just going to appoint a benevolent dictator for life over all these lists of information. We need to protect it, right? And again, enabling violent premeditated crime. And um, because I really care about this segment, if I were a threat actor, like a human trafficker, looking specifically for certain demographics, why would I not just go buy information from a data broker using a pseudonym and use that to exploit marginalized people? Why would I not do that? Ooh, because we haven't figured out they can do it yet. No, because they haven't been caught. I am convinced people are doing this and I cannot prove it. This is my conjecture. I am absolutely convinced, okay? And again, Suffering Seniors was a real list. You can go watch John Oliver's segment. I highly suggest you do it. Ecological succession, this is two pages. Okay, I know we're getting short on time. Bear with me. This is the new internet, okay? Privacy-focused, user-facing services, all right? That as a prerequisite for service in an increasingly necessary internet environment for average people, don't demand you the name of your firstborn child in order to access their services, okay? I got this from Louisa Jarboski, the privacy whisperer on LinkedIn. I highly recommend you read her stuff. She has a newsletter, it's phenomenal. Uh, this is the Council of the European Union's cookie policy banner. And she put this up, I just saw this the other day and I thought it was so good I wanted to credit her and slap it up here. This is an example of a great, a positive, a good example of a user privacy policy, right? They describe what they're doing. They describe why it's necessary, why the internet does have to collect something about you in order to use it. And that's okay, we accept that, okay? They claim that they're using anonymous data. And again, that's iffy, because we saw with Thelma Arnold, that's not technically a perfect system yet, but at least they're disclosing that they're doing it, right? And you can still check the 3,000 word privacy policy. Again, not perfect, not perfect, but better, better whoo, than some. Okay. Last slide, I told you, the top, it was top heavy. It was really top heavy. Mitigations, who wants to poop in this bathroom? Not me. This is the internet as such, okay? When I use Gmail to email my grandmother, this is how I feel, right? My, hyper, my hypothetic grandmother. Um, yeah. How do we feel about that? Good? No? Yes? Look, mitigations involve people. You can always write a better tool, but if we're gonna fix this as a community, then we need each other. We need security and privacy to work together. We need the design team to work with legal, to design and write clear user-facing summaries. We need a legal privacy policy and a user privacy policy so the user doesn't have to come through 3,000 words to find out if they're being social engineered by a company who they have social trust in, right? This has to happen. And again, this has gone on kind of unaddressed because it's an ugly topic and it makes people look like the bad guys. My goal here is not to you're the bad guy, and if we take you out, it's all going to be... No, this is an ethics problem. This is a values problem. How do we implement human flourishing and an innate respect for the identity, dignity, and care for other people into the internet? How do we do that? We do that by walking away from the old ethic, which was for research and government, okay? Which means that you guys have to go out and talk about privacy with a smile to your companies. I care about people. I don't want bad things to happen to them because we are over collecting and storing information much longer than we need to and then selling it to groups that profit off of it. So what was this talk about? Data privacy not only as a human right, but a cultural expectation. Transparent, clear, and user-friendly privacy policies that anyone can understand and either agree with or reject and not as a prerequisite for services unless they're necessary trackers right, unless it's the necessary structure of the internet. Better management of data, including data retention policies, leading to more ethical privacy strategies and decreased targets for threat actors, like poor Amy Boyer, 
Bob Lester, not forcing users to purchase free and essential digital services such as email at the cost of their information, which is then covertly sold through a clause in a legalese policy they can't be expected to read and the company knows they're not going to read on the dark web or on the shadow data broker group, okay? And it's about human flourishing. It's about caring about people enough to make the internet a truly accessible service because we care about people as cybersecurity groups, right? Who are white hat hackers or at least non-threatening black hat hackers, right? Okay. Final slide. When there's an elephant in the room, introduce them. Okay. I had a completely different wrap up to this and then I went to Mount Rushmore and bawled. <laughs> and then I cried because you could just see the care. America has a spotted history, okay? It has this very, very spotted history. We've done a lot of things wrong, but the core ideals of America and human liberty, right? Human flourishing, the dignity of others, especially those who are the most different from us, right? Is essential to our legal system, which is undermined by the legalese people accept in order to use free services, right? Those are contracts. How can somebody accept a contract they haven't read? So we went to Crazy Horse after Mount Rushmore, and Crazy Horse was awesome. Again, beautiful and moving. And I want to read this to you. There is a really poignant quote. It's one sentence. Where is the land in which my people can lay down in peace? And I don't want to, I don't want to be disrespectful, but like it really touched me. Like the average person, which we all are, are the people impacted by this under the pretense of a personal internet. Where are we? going to lay down in peace on the internet? How can I contact over a digital service that scalps my information? Literally, that's what it's called. Scanners, scrapers, scalpers. Those are the technical terms to sell to people. I can't do that. I refuse personally, and I wrote this because I knew I was not going to be able to say it. <laughs> I refuse to concede to the self-defeating prophecies which insist to have both privacy and connection. The answer is to move into the woods and disconnect entirely. That is not a feasible way forward, okay? And we are better than that. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause to which they gave the last full measure of devotion, individual liberty, right? Free from surveillance and oppression. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that the government of the people, by the people and for the people shall not perish from the earth, Lincoln. And I think that is exactly the attitude we need to take into our cybersecurity cyber communities and into our companies, not just for us, but for the people who are the most different from us. That is it. Thank you for enduring it, and I hope you enjoyed it. Any questions? Thank you. Great job, Catherine. And Catherine said that this was her first in person talk. Yeah. How about that? I'm so happy you came. Thank you so much. If you want my email, come get it, okay? What's up? I use delete me. Can you repeat the question for the- Oh yeah, he asked, um, I'm sorry. What service do I use to um, automate deletion of my data from data brokers? I use delete me. This is not a plug. I'm just a customer and I like it. It works for me. You're welcome. Thank you.